Hi everyone. It's, it's so nice to see many familiar faces and I'm so glad to be here with you this afternoon. Um, as uh, Beth told me, uh, in, introduced, uh, we have been here in Nashville for three years. As my husband was appointed uh, the Consul General of Japan in April 2015. So it's been three years and it, it's hard to believe that you know, three years have passed already. And during these three years, I attended many different classes at OLLI and learned so much about Nashville, Tennessee, and the whole United States. It's people, culture, history, and society. And it's been a great opportunity for me to understand your country better. And sadly, our assignment is coming to an end, and we are leaving uh, next week for Tokyo. And before that, I thought, what can I do for you in turn? And I thought it would be nice if you get to know a little more about my country. And that is why I, I'm doing this. And today, I would like to talk about Japan and uh, Japanese culture. But before I start, I would like to ask you a question. Did any of you knew, know that uh, there was a Japanese consulate office in Nashville before you met me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Actually, very few people in Nashville or Tennessee know about the fact. And uh, well, we, we have Japanese embassy in Washington, D.C., but uh, we also have altogether 18 consulate offices across the United States. And, yeah. So we have one in New York, Chicago, Boston, <coughs> uh, Houston, Denver, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and so on. And in the south, we have one in Atlanta, here, mm -hmm. Miami, and Houston, and Nashville. We used to have, actually, a consulate office in New Orleans, and that was one of our oldest. It was established in 1919, but 2008, it was closed and new office opened in Nashville due to increasing Japanese businesses in Tennessee and Kentucky. Presently, nearly 200 Japanese companies operate in Tennessee. And Japan is the number one investor, foreign investor in Tennessee. And actually more than half of the foreign direct investment to Tennessee is from Japan. Japan is the only country represented here in other words, we are the only foreign diplomats in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> now, you may be wondering uh, what we do here, actually. Do you have any idea? Yeah. The Consulate General of Japan represents Japan in the Japanese government. And our primary role is to protect Japanese citizens <coughs> who reside in the area. We have about 4,000 Japanese citizens living in Tennessee, the whole state, and promote friendly relations with the host states. We also organize cultural events, facilitate Japanese businesses, promote investment, and provide consular services such as issuing visas to American visitors to Japan. You're all welcome to visit Japan. <laughs> Come to our office. From Nashville, my husband covers five states, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. It's marked in green color, if you can see. It, it looks like a small area if you look at the map of the US, but it, it actually is twice as big as the entire Japan. So US, it's a big country. So naturally, my husband travels a lot on road. And when we first arrived in Nashville, three hours drive was really a long distance for us. <laughs> but now we are so used to it, and we say, oh, it's nothing. It's so close. So I, I guess we are now accustomed to the American way of life. Promoting friend friendly relations is very important for us. In Nashville, as you know, we have Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival in April, and Japanese moon viewing uh, event at Cheekwood Botanical Gardens in October. We take such events seriously as we believe they represent the friendship between Japan and Tennessee. We also promote sister city relationship. 
Japanese language study, student teacher exchange programs, which I will talk about more in detail later today. So let's look at the map of Japan. This is Japan. <coughs> Japan is located in the North Pacific off the coast of Russia and uh, the Korean Peninsula. <coughs> you see how close Japan is from South Korea, North Korea, <coughs> Russia, and China. But U.S. and Japan are actually neighbors across the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> <U.S. is here. laughs> Japan consists of four main islands and over 4,000 smaller islands. The main islands are from the north Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. Honshu is the largest island, and that's where our capital, Tokyo, is located. And that's where I will return. My home is in Tokyo. The area of Japan is slightly smaller than the, the state of California, a little larger than Germany. And our population is about 110 million. Because Japan is over 70% mountains and only about 18% of land mass is suitable for human settlement, you can well imagine how dense our cities are. For example, central Tokyo has a population of 12 million people. With the population of the greater Tokyo area, it's made it at over 35 million people. The islands of Japan are located in an area known as Pacific Ring of Fire. That is why we have a lot of earthquakes and volcanic activities. You might remember the, the earthquake, the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami that hit us in 2011. Mm -hmm. It was an unprecedented disaster and the people of Japan were really devastated. But thanks to the help pouring all over from, from all over the world, we were able to stand up strong and make efforts towards recovery. The American people were among the most generous and supportive and we are truly, truly grateful for that. As you know, Japan and the U.S. are strong economic partners, but we are also great allies in security relations. This shows how U.S. forces are deployed in Japan. Because of a security treaty, the U.S. has a significant military presence in Japan. Today, about 55,000 U.S. soldiers are stationed. This is the map of the U.S. bases in Japan. The largest and the most important base is in Okinawa, the southernmost island. Actually, this is located up there. And uh, in Nashville, I had the pleasure of meeting with many veterans who have served in Japan and returned <coughs> home here. As we organize a uh, gathering for those veterans at our residence on a regular basis. We are grateful for their service and treasure our friendship. And I am so happy to say that they come home with fond memories of Japan and share with me great stories about their life in my home country. I would now uh, like to show you a short video on Japan. This is produced by our government. There are actually tons of beautiful uh, videos on traveling in Japan. So if you are interested, go online and explore. The consulate office has a collection of videos of Japan, including some Japanese films. You can find a list of websites and our contact information on the handout. Here. So, um, let's keep going. How do I, how do I? I need help. <laughs> yeah, how do I play? Mm, was it the oh, I think it's it's this one. Yes. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. No. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you for your help. <laughs> Your 
ようこそ Yokoso means welcome. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome. Yokoso Japan, welcome to Japan. Okay. Who's screaming? How do I do this? Who's screaming? How do I go for the screen? This one? Yeah. Mm, thank you. This is, can you hear me now? Yeah. This is the Imperial Palace in springtime. The cherry blossoms are beautiful. They are blooming now. <laughs> in Japan, we have four distinct seasons, just like in Tennessee. Spring is really my favorite season, probably because of the flowers. Actually, I think cherry blossoms, or sakura as we call it, have a special place in Japanese people's heart. It is a symbol of spring. During the winter months, we look so much forward to the cherry blossoms to bloom. And TV Weather Channel has a special forecast. <laughs> it tells us exactly when and which part of Japan the cherry blossom starts to bloom. We call it Sakura Front or Cherry Blossom Front. This is a serious business. <laughs> the National Meteorological Agency has a few designated officers who go and check a specific cherry blossom tree in a specific shrine in Tokyo 
And if more than five blossoms are in bloom, they can make an official announcement. <laughs> Actually, on Friday, last Friday, I was, I was watching a Japanese TV in Nashville, and uh, there was a live coverage of this. And I saw two or three officers who were taking a close look at the, the cherry blossom trees in the rain. It was raining, and there were many people around them. And they checked every, everything so carefully, and finally said, no, not yet. Only two <laughs> blooming. <laughs> and people around them sighed of disappointment. <laughs> you might laugh, but we are so interested. And happily, last Saturday, the official announcement was finally made <laughs> in Tokyo. The cherry blossoms are blooming now. Yeah. I don't know exactly why we love this flower so much. It's hard to explain. Actually, cherry blossoms last only a few days before their petals fall off into the wind. I suppose their ephemeral beauty resonates with the Japanese spiritual traditions of Shintoism and Buddhism. Whatever the reason, the love that Japanese people have for the, the flower draw them outside every spring. For more than a thousand years, Japanese people have celebrated spring parties under cherry blossom trees. We enjoy picnic, singing, and dancing day and night under the beautiful cherry blossom trees. Remember, it only lasts a few days. <laughs> you might think that Japanese people are rather serious and quiet, but we are actually happy people, <laughs> especially with cherry blossoms and the little help of drinking sake. <laughs> 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 In 1912, the mayor of Tokyo sent 3,000 cherry blossom trees to Washington, D.C. In, in, to, to honor the lasting friendship and continuous close relationships between Japan and the United States. Since then, the sakura has become a symbol of friendship between Japan and the U.S. in cities all over this country, including right here in Nashville. The National Cherry Blossom Tree Planting Project began in 2008. For nearly 10 years, we have planted 100 trees every year. And now we have 1,000 cherry blossom trees across Nashville. We are so proud and grateful for that. You have just seen a beautiful picture of the Imperial Palace with uh, cherry blossom trees. Can you imagine that this serene Imperial Palace with the beautiful green area surrounded by the old stone moats is only a few steps from the modern Tokyo Railway Station and Marunouchi Central Business District as well as Kasumigaseki, the central government headquarter buildings. In central Tokyo, Office workers in the skyscrapers come out during the lunchtime, lunch break, and enjoy strolling the gardens around the Imperial Palace. The history of the city of Tokyo stretches back some 400 years. Originally named Edo, the city flourished under the Tokugawa shogunate for 260 years. It has been the center of politics and culture in Japan for 400 years. So. Tokyo has many historic sites like Imperial Palace and shrines and temples. On the other hand, with economic expansion and modernization, many new buildings have been constructed, and today they exist side by side. You can easily find old Japan and new Japan in Tokyo. For example, this is Dojoji Temple of Tokugawa era. And it is just next to Tokyo Tower, a landmark for the tourists in modern days. Here's another example. This is a quiet Meiji shrine on your left. And just a few steps from it is Harajuku, a very busy street, Takeshita Dori Street, where young people gather to enjoy pop culture and fashion and they sing and dance. They have a good time there. 
So Tokyo is where old and new meet, combine and live together. Japanese culture is the same way. It is unique in the sense that old and new live together. While we value our cultural traditions that go back hundreds and thousands of years, Japanese people are also curious and avid learners of foreign culture. We love and welcome new and different things. We are good at integrating both to our life. Let's take food, for example. This is a typical Japanese traditional breakfast. Our traditional meal consists of a bowl of steamed white rice, which is the most important. It's our staple food. And um, miso soup, a few dishes of assorted vegetables, and fish or egg. No meat. As for soup, we use seafood stock instead of chicken or beef stock. We eat a lot of vegetables, mostly steamed or boiled. No butter or oil. Japanese traditional food is very lean and healthy. Today we still have such traditional Japanese food, but we also enjoy many different sorts of cuisine. Over the centuries, Japan has imported a variety of food from all over the world. Meanwhile, Japanese food has become recently so popular across the world. By the way, when we say Japanese food, people instantly think of sushi and ramen. However, we don't eat sushi all the time in Japan. <laughs> Our actual daily meals are very much varied. This is Japanese food today. As you can see, we have you know, Japanese food, Chinese food, Italian, French, American, Indian, Thai, you know, whatever, all kinds. One may have, for example, coffee, toast, eggs, and fruits for breakfast, pasta for lunch, grilled fish for, or steak for dinner. Others may have miso soup and rice for breakfast in the morning. Others have ramen noodles for lunch and go Chinese for dinner. We cook and enjoy all different kinds of food in our daily life. But it doesn't mean that we don't value our traditional food. We still love and place great importance on Japanese food. So if we want to have a really best sushi or ramen, ultimately you'd have to go to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a closer look at sushi, for example. Are you familiar with sushi? When I came to Nashville, I was really amazed at how popular sushi is in Nashville. So many places serve sushi, and you can find sushi even in grocery, <laughs> grocery shops. In Japan, sushi started as a way of preserving fish by means of fermenting harvested fish with rice. Transformation of sushi occurred in the 18th century, Tokyo. It was called Edo at that time. A new style sushi, nigiri, was invented and became hugely popular as street food. People enjoyed a quick bite of sushi on the way home from work or from public bath. Fresh seafood was readily available from Tokyo Bay and sushi chefs competed each other in preparing tasty sushi. This was the beginning of what we call nigiri sushi today. Fresh seafood, on top of bite-sized rice balls flavored with vinegar. By the way, sushi literally means vinegar-flavored rice in Japanese. <laughs> These are some of our traditional sushi varieties. We have all different kinds of traditional sushis. Rolled sushi, on your right-hand side, this one, is uh, seafood, vegetables, and rice rolled in seaweed, dried seaweed. And the chirashi sushi is on your right hand side on top. It's in a bowl. It's a bowl of sushi rice with various seafood toppings. And inari sushi is on top. Uh, it's sushi rice wrapped in deep fried and soy sauce flavored tofu skin. It's vegetarian. And uh, finally on the bottom, it's oshi sushi or pressed sushi. Sushi rice and seafood formed like a cake. But sushi is constantly evolving. As sushi spread around the globe, new types of sushi have been invented. World sushi chefs 
have introduced new ingredients, preparation, and serving methods. New variety of cut rolls have gained popularity in recent years. California rolls with avocado and smoked salmon. <laughs> Philadelphia rolls with cream cheese. You even have rolls with spicy mayonnaise and buttered deep fried rolls. I have also heard of Nashville rolls. <laughs> <laughs> These creative additions reflect a distinct Western influence. And importantly, these new ideas are imported back to Japan. And we now enjoy them in Tokyo. So it is interesting to see how the world of sushi is going to change. Now, next example is tea ceremony, or chanoyu, as we call it in Japanese. You might think that tea ceremony is basically about drinking green tea, but the essence of it is rather spiritual. Under the influence of Zen Buddhism, the tea ceremony was gradually established not as a mere act of drinking tea, but as a means for dev devoting oneself to a profound spiritual world. The fundamentals of the tea ceremony were perfected by a Zen monk named Senno Rikyu in the 15th century. Tea ceremony is actually full of complicated rules and formalities, but each movement has a meaning and it is a spiritual and aesthetic experience. The spirit of Chanoyu comes alive when welcoming guests and meeting with friends. We believe the moment we share is extremely precious, as it can never be the same again. We call it Ichigo Ichie, literally meaning one time, one, meaning, one meeting. Appreciating every moment in life is in the heart of Japanese people. On your left hand side is a tea house. It is a small, small room with tatami mat surrounded by a Japanese garden. It is considered to be a quiet and serene place totally shut from the outside world. The structure of the tea house does not allow you to carry anything inside due to its tiny, tiny entrance. The entrance is there. You have to crawl to go inside. So in the old times, samurai warriors had to leave their swords outside in the waiting room. It was a very special place. As you enter the room, you first contemplate the ikebana, the flower arrangement, and uh, the scroll. It's usually a picture or calligraphy. You greet the host and say a few words of appreciation about the beauty of these displays. Then you elegantly proceed on the tatami mat to your place and greet the other guests. The host, on the other hand, is supposed to prepare the setting to perfection. The garden, the steps, tea house, art displays, and good tea with beautiful, beautifully polished utensils. It is very quiet, and the only sound you hear is a slowly boiling water. Through these procedures, both the host and the guest naturally have a, a peace of mind and become ready for tea. The four important elements of tea ceremony are harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility or calm. When every guest is seated, the host starts to make tea, and the guests have some kind of sweet confectionaries first, then each guest is served a bowl of tea. Tea house is where you enjoy company and appreciate peace. I brought a tea set uh, here. This is a tea bowl, and this is a container for the powdered green tea. And this is a scoop for the powdered green tea. And this is actually how you make it. You, you put the powdered green tea and pour hot water and then mix it and serve. And actually, matcha or powdered green tea is available in, in Nashville, in the Japanese grocery shops, like this, in, in packets like this. I could probably show you. Can you pass this around so that people can see? Thank you. Today, many, mm, 
Many of Japanese daily manners and etiquettes are influenced by tea ceremony. We learn how to be good hostesses and how to be good guests through tea ceremony. It has been therefore common for young ladies to, prax to practice tea ceremony before marriage <laughs> in order to cultivate good manners and refinement. By the way, there used to be three kinds of art that Japanese uh, young ladies were supposed to learn before marriage. Tea ceremony is one, and the other two are flower arrangement, ikebana, and incense appreciation, kodo. Today they are not considered so, so important, but still appreciated in good families. Kodo is no longer much practiced, but tea ceremony and flower arrangements are still very popular and, practic and, and practical too. I myself have learned tea ceremony at Urasenke School and flower arrangement at Sogeto School of Ikebana. I don't really practice tea ceremony, to be honest, but enjoy flower arrangement in my daily life. Interestingly, the use of powdered green tea has seen dramatic evolution. Green tea products became very popular not only in Japan, but also in foreign countries. On top of its health benefits that recently discovered, beautiful green color, refreshing and slightly bitter taste of matcha have gained popularity all over the world. We now enjoy matcha ice cream, <laughs> matcha <laughs> cakes and candies. Matcha is even used for skincare products. Mm -hmm. Let's take a, a video, uh, let's take a look at the video on tea ceremony and green tea production. This is the in introduction part, so please bear with me. strictly according to tradition. The Chanoyu ceremony uses a special kind of tea called matcha. The matcha leaves are finely ground with a heavy millstone to produce a brilliantly green powder with the deepest possible flavor. produced by these gentle hills. It was here in the 16th century that Japan's distinctive powdered green tea matcha was born. Tea growers covered their plants in cold weather to protect against frost. Finding this also improved the flavor, they experimented. By blocking the sunlight to control the rate of photosynthesis in the new buds, they reduced the bitterness of the tea, making it both milder and more full-bodied. Sen no Rikyu, most famous of tea masters, established the tea ceremony tradition in the 16th century. At this time, matcha from Uji was considered the highest luxury. By the 17th century, Uji was sending annual tributes of tea to the shoguns in Edo, present-day Tokyo. The heavy jars of tea were carried to the capital in a formal procession. 
tea or tea blenders continue to improve the quality of matcha. At this establishment, they've been blending tea for 450 years. Tea is a plant, so left to nature, the quality and flavor will vary year by year, even for leaves from the same field. We have to carefully tune our process all the time in order to maintain a uniform taste for our teas. This is done by special blending methods, handed down through generations of chashi. Through their secret blending methods, today's chashi maintain Uji's position as the source of premier matcha. Every October in Uji, water is drawn from the Uji River for a special tea ceremony held to honor Senno Rikyu and the great tea masters of old. Today we can enjoy the taste of matcha not only in drinks but in many kinds of foods too. This Riote restaurant uses matcha in many of its dishes. And tourists to Uji delight in the range of matcha flavored sweets and desserts on offer. Uji, birthplace of matcha, still plays a key role in Japan's culture of tea. Have you ever tried origami or a paper folding? <laughs> These are some examples. And you can make uh, three-dimensional things with a piece of paper, like that. Would you like to pass this around? Thank you. And these are the origami papers. It is a Japanese art of making a variety of shapes with paper through various combinations of folds without using any cuts or pastes. You can create three-dimensional objects using a single sheet of square paper. You can make beautiful pieces like flowers, animals, and birds. In the old times, it started as a uh, wraps for religious and ceremonial purposes in Japan. We still take extra care when wrapping a gift. The most formal way of wrapping a gift was with washi paper, Japanese paper, decorated with mizuhiki, or colored paper strings. Washi paper was folded in specific ways for specific purposes. We also use a piece of cloth to wrap gifts and important things. It is called furoshiki. I brought a few furoshikis here too. A piece of cloth. Yeah. And you can wrap things like uh, let's see. a book. And you can even make a bag out of a piece of cloth, like tying each end, this end. And it goes inside, turn it round, and it's a bag. You can carry things inside. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You could use your scarf to, to do the same thing. And froshikis are usually made of silk, but um, today we have some sy synthetic materials too, because they are much easier to handle. And this is a bottle. 
It's holding a bottle, actually. So two, if you have wine, wine bottles, <laughs> you can just, you know, roll it together like this. It's a bit loose. And make sure this is coming inside. Just like that. And if you tie it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can carry it. <laughs> so we have this tradition of using clothes and paper in our daily life a lot. Yeah. Okay. So um, going back to origami, gradually folding paper became a popular pastime for, for children. At home and at school, children enjoy origami. We also make paper cranes to wish good luck or prompt recovery. We call them senbazuru, um, a thousand paper cranes. So when, for example, for, for your friend, we, we wish a prompt recovery and people get together and put our hearts together, our hands together and make thousand paper cranes, sending good wishes. But origami is really more than that. Techniques of folding a sheet of paper have, be, have applied to more, more practical use these days. There have been spectacular achievements in the application of origami in modern science and technology. Origami approach is useful when you want to significantly reduce the size of an object so that you can transport it easily and then unfold it to the original form at the destination. For example, we can bring antenna or solar panels, telescopic mass, tanks to space stations, and to back to Earth. This is Miura Ori fold, a special fold invented by a Japanese astrophysicist, Dr. Koryo Miura. It is like a magic. I wanted to show you how to do it, but it was not as simple as I thought. <laughs> so, but you can see on the next video how it is done. The mirror fold is a form of rigid origami, meaning that the fold can be carried out by a continuous motion in which at each step, each parallelogram is completely flat. This property allows it to be used to fold surfaces made of rigid materials. For instance, large solar panels for space stations in the Japanese space program have been mirror folded before launch and then spread out in space, like this. Furthermore, making use of shape memory materials, MIT and Harvard researchers have created a self-assembling robot that folds itself starting from a flat sheet, of, flat sheet in, in four minutes and walks away from its starting point. <laughs> Amazing. Other advanced applications of origami are a paper-based lithium, lithium ion battery, stents that unfold inside arteries, automotive crash absorbing structures, or a microscope folded from a piece of paper. Today, origami is accepted by the scientific community as more than an artistic activity. I will show you my last video on how origami have developed and how the technique is used in science and technology. Wow, it's difficult to see. I'm sorry, I need help.
This is the same introduction, I'm sorry. <laughs> Traditional techniques are capable of producing very complex and realistic shapes. Today, researchers in many technical fields study origami methods for their practical applications. For example, this medical device called a stent is used to enlarge clogged blood vessels. Origami is behind many such inventions in nanotechnology. The technique called Namako Ori allows the round stent to be compressed until it's narrow enough to be inserted into a blood vessel using a balloon catheter. The balloon is then inflated to expand the stent and enlarge the blood vessel. Many new products have been developed using the origami method called Neuroori. In this method, folds in one direction run in straight lines, while in the other direction, the folds follow the zigzag line. Simply pulling and pushing on the corners expands and compresses the paper. Oh, oh. A Mura Ori folded map can be easily opened. <laughs> 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 Mura Ori can also add reinforcing corrugations to a surface. Metal can manufacturers use it for increased strength. Mm. From a children's game, origami has developed into a versatile technological tool. Mura Ori will be very useful in disaster relief. Cabins and other structures made this way can be folded completely for transportation and then quickly and easily expanded to their full size on site. It will also be convenient for preparing stores of such supplies ready for an instant response. Origami is even used in this. This is the Japanese interplanetary spacecraft Ikaros, launched in 2010. An origami called Shikaku Gato Ori was used to solve the slight centrifugal force produced by the spacecraft's rotation is enough to open and close the four huge sails. The sun's power charges the batteries of the first ever spacecraft to be powered by this technology. When weight and size are limited, origami-inspired technology can often provide the simplest solutions. As the techniques developed by this ancient pastime find ever more advanced technological applications, it seems that origami has endless potential. Thank you. Okay. So today I have talked about sushi, tea ceremony, and origami and many other aspects of contemporary Japanese culture, such as music, theatrical play, clothing, architecture, transportation system, and also a combination of uh, are also a combination of traditional and modern. Our traditional cultures keep evolving to respond to the demands of the time, continuously creating new and unique things. In relation to this uniqueness, I would like to discuss a bit about what we call cool Japan. <laughs> Originally, cool Japan referred to a Japanese pop culture, such as teen fashion, anime, manga, J-pop music, computer games that had gained popularity overseas. Hello Kitty or Pokemon are well-known characters. 
As the number of foreign tourists, uh, foreign visitors increase, other cool aspects of Japanese life have been pointed out by the visitors. This includes high-tech vending machines that offer hot and cold beverages as well as hot meals. Convenience stores that are open 24-7 and offer almost everything you want. High-quality cosmetics, beautiful gift wrapping, convenient lunch boxes, high-tech toilets, and high-speed train systems, and so on. There are, uh, these are the things that Japanese people took it for granted. They were part of our daily life and meant really nothing special to us. But thanks to the positive feedback from foreign visitors, we rediscovered the value of Japan's unique culture. So today, cool Japan has a more broad meaning. It includes many different aspects of the convenience of Japanese life. Meanwhile, the Japanese government, in turn, has launched Cool Japan campaign, looking at Japan's cultural ex exports, including animation, fashion, and food, in order to promote Japan's soft power. And it is hoped that the increased presence of Japanese cultural products will attract more international travelers and boost domestic tourism. Personally, I am not sure about this approach. <laughs> I, I think culture totally depends on, on personal taste. And it is, sometime, it is something that spreads naturally from people to people. But anyway, I think cool Japan is a new concept, and it, it is an interesting concept. In the last place, I would like to add a few words on Japan-Tennessee relations. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of my talk, I said business relations are very strong between Japan and Tennessee, and that ne nearly 200 Japanese companies mostly in the automotive sector, are operating here. I suppose many of you know that Nissan and Bridgestone have he headquarters, American headquarters in Middle Tennessee. These companies not only create jobs, but also contribute to build better communities, offering scholarships, providing job training, supporting community activities. Take Smyrna, for example. Nissan has the largest automotive plant <coughs> in North America, in Smyrna. Before Nissan came, I heard Smyrna had a population of 8,000. Now, uh, the, the company kept expanding, and uh, now it is celebrating 35th year of operation. Today, Nissan Smyrna employs over 8,000 people, and the population of Smyrna has increased to surpass 48,000. I had the opportunity vi to visit the Nissan Smyrna uh, facility last month, and it was really amazing. It's huge. And you can take a tour if you make a reservation. So I, I highly recommend that. It's, it's really amazing. Our cultural exchanges are strong, too. For example, Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival had 45,000 visitors last year. It has become the largest Japan fest in the South. It is bigger than Atlanta or Houston now. It was reported in Japan, and our prime minister was really delighted and made positive comments about Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't come before, please join us this year's fest on Saturday, 14th of April. You will be able to experience Japanese tea ceremony, enjoy music, dance, Japanese drums, martial art demonstrations, and many more. It's a family friendly event. You can sample Japanese food and enjoy rice pounding and bone dance with us. Eight Tennessee cities have sister city relationships with Japan. Nashville is one of them. Does anyone know what that city is? Any idea? <laughs> Kamakura. Kamakura is located just one hour drive southwest of Tokyo. It's a beautiful, beautiful city surrounded by <coughs> the, the mountains and the ocean. As Kamakura was an old capital of Japan during Kamakura period, the samurai government was based there, so there are very interesting historic sites, including uh, uh, Tsurugaoka Hachimangu Shrine there, and Kenchoji Temple and Great Buddha that you can see here. 
Every year, a group of country musicians from Kamakura come to Nashville to perform at Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival. <coughs> this is a part of Nashville Kamakura Sister City program. I hope you will also have a chance to visit Kamakura. Not only Kamakura, but also Tokyo and many other places to Jap in, in Japan. There is nothing like first-hand experience. Talking about visiting Japan, <coughs> I would like to say a final few words about the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, also known as the JET Program. JET is my country's version of exchange programs like the Fulbright Scholarship and American Field Service. JET participants work as assistant English teachers in, in Japanese schools and at the same time immerse themselves in Japanese culture. <laughs> Travel expenses and salaries are paid by our government and it is a great opportunity for young people to get to know Japan. They help the bridge between our two countries both during their time in Japan and upon their return to Tennessee because they have an excellent understanding of our culture and strong cross-cultural communication skills. Already some JET graduates are teaching at universities like Vanderbilt and Austin P. Others work at Japanese companies and some are engaged in local economic and community development. Since its inception in 1986, more than 30,000 Americans have stayed in Japan through this program. We send off from our consulate about 50 participants of a new class of JET in August every year. And, and I really hope this program will flourish even more in the future. I believe this is really a great program, but sadly it's not yet well known in Tennessee. So I would like to encourage more young Tennesseans to join and really appreciate it if you could spread the words around you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope my presentation broadened your view of Japan and I sincerely hope you will have a chance to visit Japan. Japan is truly a beautiful country and I'm sure you will enjoy your stay. As I say goodbye to Nashville, I wish you all the best and Nashville has given me wonderful memories. And I will fold them like origami and put it in a treasure box in my heart, then bring it back to Tokyo, then I will carry it with me as we continue our journeys across the world. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.